Hello, and welcome to Fireside with the VC. My name is Andrew Romans, and I'm really excited to have my friend with a very unique fund, which I think is super, super cool, Nitin um, Pashisya. Um, Nitin, welcome to the pod. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. So Nitin's fund is called um, Unshackled. Um, is it Unshackled Ventures, right, is the full name? Yeah. Yep. And I, I don't know, I, I almost feel like we met walking down the street in Palo Alto, but we obviously met somewhere. <laughs> and you, you, you know, I, I haven't been to it in a while, but used to have these like, just right in the office, a couple of bottles of the wine on the table and all VCs and investors coming in there with some portfolio companies. And I love the networking event, but the unshackled name I just thought was super, super cool, but it's actually really defining of what you guys do and who you are. So. Why don't we start with the name? Can you explain why did you name your firm, which you, of course, co-founded, Unshackled Ventures? Yeah, it was, to be honest, one of the easiest naming conversations in the history of all names that I've come up with, including our children's names. Uh, Manan and I, when we decided to start, it was April 1st, 2014, the morning uh, between 10 and 12. We decided that we're doing this and it was obvious that we need a name for it. And what what better? So we, we started thinking of how do our customers feel if we enable what we enable for them? What's the outcome? And uh, Unshackled was the, the feeling that we both kind of felt because we've been through the journey ourselves, and, and as we think of our, our customer, that's the founders, we feel like it's not, and, and to be clear, it wasn't just about Unshackling from uh, immigration, because sometimes it gets it gets positioned only in that, but it's more about um, unshackling from anything that is slowing you down in terms of building your company. Um, immigration is one part of it, but when we think of our specific target audience, which is the immigrant founders, it's also slowing down in terms of how do I get introduced to seed investors? How do I get introduced to these enterprise customers? I want to go get the CMO from this big shot company and I need someone to make that intro so I can I can have a chat and impress that person how great we are. And and all of those things lumped together kind of summed into um, Unshackled Ventures and, and uh, the brand just took off. And just like you said, it's it's been pretty fortunate that uh, it's not our last names. Um, and 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 it's a memorable name, meaning when founders and other investors hear the name. Um, they, they remember two things, or as we've learned, they remember two things. It, it's uh, Unshackled Ventures is the name, and they do something with immigrant founders. So right. anytime we meet immigrant founders, Unshackled Ventures. So when, when you feel like you need to drink uh, soda, the name that pops in your mind is, is the equivalent of, if we, if we meet immigrant founders, Unshackled Ventures should pop in the mind. That's good. And, and I'll say it super briefly, but I want you to elaborate on it. Your Unshackled Ventures essential model is mapped after your own journey that you were something like 24 years old, I think, when you moved to the United States from India and you had the experience of what it's like to land with essentially no network or anything. And, um, you know, even I think I told you when we were speaking the other day, my first job out of undergrad in 1993 was a Unix headhunter slash software company. And we were hiring Indian IIT, you know, they have to crawl over 10,000 people to get one slot. And these are the best, just pure statistics. And we'd hire these guys out of IIT, put them on H-1B visas, and then have them do different things. But they, we were shackling them. And you know, I'm not proud of it, but like, it was the only job I could get to pay me. And uh, they, we were shackling <laughs> H-1B visa people, literally, and probably not paying them the full amount that they were really worth once they get their green cards. Um, but that your model is now is that you'll take at least one founder on the team is an immigrant and, um, and, and that's what you're funding, which is a certain amount of grit on, you know, the kind of Sergey Brins that, that, that do, you know, make the journey. And then you actually provide like one-stop immigration services. Like, you, you know, the drill, you have it down to a science. That's one less thing to worry about, right. but there's everything else of, um, how to introduce them to everybody that you know, right? Yeah, and, and so that's kind of the, the the thesis is around you've made the journey to come to the U.S. You you outcompeted seven billion people who are people outside the U.S. 
to be one of a couple million people that get to come to the US and choose to come to the US. So sometimes in this conversation, it's forgotten that the person who is coming, the immigrant, also has a say in the process and they're choosing to come to the US versus going to Canada or Singapore or, or UK or Germany. And, and there's a consciousness around it because the more entrepreneurial kind choose to come to the US, they know this is the land of entrepreneurship, their prospects as an entrepreneur are higher here. So, so you outcompete, 7 billion people, you choose to come to the US, you start integrating into the, into the culture, either because you came for education or you came for work, you start learning the way of life in the US. And some, some point in the future, you decide, I think I'm ready to start my company because there's a big problem that I'm uniquely suited to solve. And therefore, and the best way to do it is to start a, a startup. Uh, when you do that, you need some additional resources around you. As a worker, as a student, it's not that complex, to be honest. Compared to everything that you've done to come to that point, getting your F1 student visa or the H1B worker visa, it's not super complex. Like my life was super easy when I was at Deloitte or joined the startup, no after that. Um, but then comes that step where the nuance kicks in, which is the, the immigration system, our immigration system hasn't provided for what if someone wants to be an entrepreneur, someone who came here as a student or a worker wants to be an entrepreneur, what pathway can we give them? And so we've, we're, we're fixing that inefficiency slash lack of existence of a pathway. And, and the way to approach it is, well, People are going to continue to work in terms of making the policy better, and we should absolutely do it. But in the meantime, can we apply the policy the way it exists without circumventing anything, without breaking any laws, without um, letting these immigrants get out of status? How do we become a resource for these founders and enable them to do what they do? And so that's kind of the, the foundation of the immigration playbook is you're not doing anything wrong. You just want to do what you want to do, and we can give you the structure to do it. And that's why um, I shared with you before the R&D lab structure that we created so researchers can come in and do R&D there. The, the one uh, specification um, or, or clarification I should make is our investments are in immigrants who could now be residents, uh, permanent residents, or could be citizens. So it's not just visa holders. Uh, but the way the immigration playbook has kind of manifested itself really well is if any of the founders are on a visa, we take care of their immigration all the way to green card and citizenship because building a company takes a long time. You're not going to be on a visa for all this time. But if you are now a permanent resident or citizen, we know that some of the key employees that you're going to hire are yeah. going to be people who are on visas. And, and our playbook allows you to not lose that talent because you were not equipped to take care of immigration. So the, the, the playbook, the same structure, uh, propagates itself really, really well in terms of bringing on some of this key talent. It actually becomes an advantage for the portfolio company to be able to, to work with these uh, uh, key employees better than their competition. And, you know, and it's the, a, let me just jump in and say something for some of the yeah. listeners that are not in the you know, have the experience of being a VC or a, you know, VC backed entrepreneur or high growth entrepreneur without VCs, there's a talent war that is vicious. So hiring, staffing a company anywhere in this planet is really, really, really hard. And Silicon Valley is tough. I mean, you're hiring a, an engineer, like a data scientist, they're interviewing you more than you're interviewing them. when you're the CEO, it's unbelievable. And um, dealing with immigration, um, is like a, an advantage if you can, if you can 100%. not, if you're not dropping the ball in there, it's a, it's a, it's another sword in the battle of the talent war. Any, any inefficiency that applies to the entire category that you can solve for and your competition hasn't becomes an advantage for you. It's, it's still a disadvantage for everybody else. And and the one the you know the one thing I wanted to clarify is, for example, what you mentioned about what you were doing hiring IITians and and employing them on H one B you're not shackling them just by hiding them on H-1B. In fact, H-1B, E3, TN, these are great mechanisms that our economy has to bring some of the best talent into the country. And people who go on those visas don't look at that as you're shackling me to this visa. For the time that I want to work for a Google, Facebook, Apple, 
who have Goldman Sachs, that visa is the way that I'm going to work there because I need some status. Some I'm not a U.S. citizen, so I need some status or permit to be able to work there. And I, I choose that path because that's the best path for me to be a legal employee in the country. And, and there's a very small portion of those employees who will come on these visas who become entrepreneurs, right? Um, the, the, the negative aspect of it only comes into play because we haven't designed that pathway like the Startup Visa Act, for example, which you know a lot of people worked on, the international entrepreneur rule that sort of exists, but there's like no usage of it because the path, the way to use it doesn't, hasn't been clarified. But uh, w w what I'm really trying to clear here is there is absolutely no negative sentiment around our the visas that exist the way they exist. The it's it's a niche problem. It's a corner case where someone who comes um, you know to study uh, medicine and decides to start a company. How do we facilitate that? Um, as you know, the the total number of entrepreneurs is is much lesser than the total number of population, and so. The solution that you and I get to work on is specific to how do we work with the entrepreneurs to amplify their time. The the rest of the population is is fine in their own means, or somebody else is working on solving their problems. Well, you know, in, in, in our defense, I mean, I was kind of joking that we were shackling people, but the truth is, at Pencom Systems or this this Unix company, we would hire an IIT in and put them on an H one B, and when they wanted to change jobs, we allowed that to happen. So yeah. they stayed as an employee, I guess a W-2 of Pencom. Then yeah. they'd be working at like database administrator in New York City at JP Morgan. And then they want to work for a systems company and work for Oracle. We would help them move to California and um, put them at Oracle and not kick them to the, be to the, to the starting line of the queue because they're already in two years towards exactly their, right. their, their green card. And so they were able to hop around and we even yeah. had them working for us and we IPO'd Pancom Software in Austin, Texas. So, you know, yeah, in, it's, in a way we were making it work for them in a, in a really messed up system. The, the game is not wrong. You just need to understand the rules of the game, right? It's, it's um, um, I, I kind of look at it as a more of a, a set of rules have been de have been defined in our immigration policy. The the better you understand the rules, or you work with someone who understands the rules, and they're going to help you win in terms of what you want to do. H um, one B, for example, is one of the most affordable visas. You you work for one employer, you decide to work for another employer. All that employer has to do is file a change of employment, and as long as they are eligible and you're working in the specialized occupation, there's a few conditions, but most employers will meet that condition. And it's super easy for you to move around. Um, other visas have their own nuances. And you know, as we have now um, invested in founders from 26 different countries on 12, 13 different kinds of visas and green cards, hmm. there's so many provisions in the policy to accommodate for where you were born, what you've studied, what experience you have, what kind of family background you have. There's a ton that goes into deciding what is the best immigration pathway for you to do what you want to do? It's, it's not like just, just because you're on H-1B, you can do something else. An H-1B employee could also be eligible for an E-2 visa, for example, and that might be the way how they become an entrepreneur. Um, or that H-1B employee may have an H-1B spouse and they can get an H-4 EAD, and on that EAD, they can now do whatever it is that they want to do. Or they can come and work at a research lab and and you know do the R and D and research, grow the company, um, and then the company can hire. There's there's so many nuances to this. The hmm. key um, is working with people. So as an entrepreneur, you don't have a ton of time to become an expert in in immigration, right? You're already taking on big problems. So you work with partners who know this game and and can therefore amplify your time. You get to benefit from all the learnings that they've had. Um, and, and apply it to your situation. The ROI for someone like us to do it is when, when I started doing it for myself and figuring it out, it was one-on-one -on -one ROI. Like if I got it right, I was the one entrepreneur who could now do what I wanted to do. Now that we have done over 150 filings and we have this big portfolio, our playbook replicates and is scalable. So ROI now is many to one, not one to one. Yeah. So that's why for founders, it's, it's key to, to get to the right partners, 
Uh, most immigration attorneys are trained to give oversimplified answers. Oh, you're on H-1B, you can't do this. Not, don't take that as an answer. Keep, keep finding the, or keep going knocking on doors until you find that right partner who will say, what is it that you want to do? Let me find the best legal pathway to do this so that you don't lose your status, you're not in, uh, you know, out of compliance or anything. And that's, that's working great for us. So, you know, immigration was kind of that starting point. And then we learned, uh, I was shared with, shared with you before, um, when immigrants come here, if, you, if you're coming here as, an, as a young adult for education, you go through the education process, or you come here like me, you're 24, 25, uh, you're a worker, you kind of left that, that friends and family network back in your home country. And so um, you are at a slight disadvantage compared to an entrepreneur who may have grown up in the US, you have you have your friends and family network. And so we kind of look at it as can we become that friends and family? Can we open the, the doors that otherwise friends and family network would open? And that's replicated into a lot of uh, a, a lot of our connections, a lot of our network that's now working for the entrepreneurs. And we're now kind of starting to take a community view of it, which is how do we even take ourselves out of the picture or reduce ourselves in the picture? and let the community work with the founders directly. And, and we're starting to see some really interesting signs of uh, what that could do. That's, that's scale, right? That, that's where we can scale ourselves beyond uh, just our capabilities. Yeah, I mean, I challenge you on saying that the immigration system in the United States is not good. I think it's ridiculous, I think it's horrible. Um, I, I went through the HM Highly Skilled Migrant Visa Program when I was pretty young in the UK just wanted to move to London. And, uh, you know, it made a lot more sense to me than what the US does. I mean, you get points for an MBA, you get points for being young, you get points for even a bank balance or accomplishments. And, you know, I think that we were talking about the Australian system is pretty good. So yeah. at some point, I'd love to support you in lobbying the government to do something that makes more sense and i think that oh they, don't they, get me wrong to to i'm i'm on like i'm not saying the system is is great and nothing should change i'm just saying that as an immigrant when i get that h1b visa i'm not looking at all the nuances around it i'm happy that i got the visa to get the chance that i needed to be here and do what i want to do the system can be a million times better yeah. I mean, I've been uh, the, the kind of stuff that we have seen in terms of things that just fall at USCIS. They make a rule, you send them the paperwork according to that rule. Two months later, they change the rule. They say now you, you need a different set of paperwork. Mm. Then the administration changes or, you know, the director changes and they say, oh, wait a second, we're going back to the old rule. So now you need to send all that same paperwork, but you have to redo it because that is past 60 days. I just did that for my green card petition and it, it's annoying as hell. So uh, I agree with you 100%. The system can be a million times better. But my point was kind of more around the sentiment that if as an employer, you are hiring someone on H-1B, you're, sh you're shackling them. You're not. You're giving them an opportunity as well. And they are taking that opportunity with open eyes. The, the process part of it, yes, man, that I, 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 I will be grateful if anyone can take that and make the process better. Yeah. That that will be a huge win for the U.S. It'll make the employers so much yeah. more efficient. I mean, I mean, I'll tell you, the, the um, people who think that they are helping Americans by not allowing a software engineer to move to the United States are just wrong. I think that they're saying no to gold. You bring that software engineer over here, we tax the engineer. You don't let him in, we hire the engineer in Mumbai and you know in Chennai. And now yeah. we're just, we're, we're throwing money out of the current account. They're not spending money on a multiplier of going out to a steakhouse, yeah. buying a drink, buying a car, the whole, the whole multiplier thing. It's just like dumb and dumber running the government. Yeah. I think it's clear one, that our best one job creates don't go into civil services. Our best people are not going one, into civil service. <laughs> yeah. One high scale, one, one high skill job creates three and a half jobs in the ecosystem around them, oh, the yeah. restaurants, the, the delis and the, you know, the dry cleaners, there, there's, there's a lot of that effect. And now you, you take that and you say, you, you refused letting hundred of those engineers in one of those could have been that entrepreneur who started Snowflake. Yeah. Right. You've offshored 1200 jobs by not letting that person start their company here. The yeah. worst form of offshoring is saying no to entrepreneurs who want to build their businesses 
in the U.S. because they're going to go and do it somewhere. And, and you've now said no to all those jobs. So it, it's it's imp it, it's really the the right way to approach it is how do we make it the simplest for U.S. employers to hire the best skilled people who will who will increase the value of the company, increase jobs, and and bring that contribution into the economy here, and then think of what are the ways in which if some of them want to start businesses and and hire thousands of people how do we be supportive of that and you know what yeah. we're doing at our level is the private sector approach to it um, but I, I would i would love for us to not have to be the only experts in in immigration because it's so complex i would love the system to become so simple that anyone can do it. And that way we get to spend our energies and founders get to spend their energies on actual business things. Let's get yeah. more customers. Let's, let's, let's ship product. Well, um, you know, in, in real estate, people say that the most important things are location, location, location. And in venture capital and entrepreneurship, I say the most important things are uh, management team, management team, management team, market uh, technology. And so it's like all about management. The, you, you guys are focused on at least one immigrant founder on the team. Um, as a metaphor, I, I have a theory that um, Jewish people make great entrepreneurs because many years ago, they were not allowed to enter jobs of government. They were not allowed to you know, um, get into the big education things. They were not allowed to you know, work for the top 40 largest companies in that country or city or town. So they were forced to go out and start something of their own just to provide for their families. And so if great, 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 great granddad was an entrepreneur in like Belarus, Russia, or, you know, it passes down um, a DNA of entrepreneurship. What do you think, what are you seeing? What do you sense about immigrants being good entrepreneurs or innovators? Yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of thinking on you, you have a lot of documented history of how successful immigrants have been. And when you read about why, um, it's, it's kind of shallow. So I've kind of developed my theories and I talk a lot with Maria and Manan about this. The, the way we kind of think about it is it's a combination of a few things. Number one, in terms of ideation. So think of a situation where you've grown up in the same system, you've seen the same system, and you take a lot of those things for granted, whether it's a large system like how our democracy works or a small system like how air conditioning in our homes work. But you've taken certain things as this is a given. Now you bring someone who's never been in this system, you bring them from somewhere else and you plant them in the system. They question things. They question things because it was different that somewhere else versus where it's here. And they say, well, this is great. Uh, you know, it's great that I can get cold air and, and warm air whenever I want, but we are also wasting a lot of energy on it. So if we could use this technique that we used to use there, because energy wasn't free and wasn't abundant, I can make this a much more efficient system. And you, you've now created a new idea that can, that can impact 155 million households. Um, and so one part of it is just somebody new looking at what is otherwise considered given. Um, you're converting constants into variables by doing that. So, so that's where a, a lot of the brilliant ideas come from. The, the second part of it is kind of what you were hinting on, which is sometimes you're just forced to take the entrepreneurial path and, and you're forced to do it because uh, your credentials were different in your home country than they are here and people aren't going to hire you for those credentials. And so to, uh, to, to make ends meet for your family, you start doing things that you are really good at. And you have a lot of this SMB entrepreneurship as a thread of the US economy, which, which really comes from, uh, I can outwork anybody and I can be really good at what I do. And by doing that, I'm creating value for someone and I'll charge a value for that. And so, um, so, so that just be, becoming an entrepreneur out of need is, is another piece. And then the third piece that ap appeals a lot to us is the grit aspect of it, right? You, you've gone through a certain journey. Um, we were talking about this earlier, right? The, the out competing of a large population to, to get to a point where uh, NIIT would select you. 
then to get to a point where a Georgia Tech would would recruit you uh, coming out of IITs, then to get to a point where a, a Basim or or Qualcomm is is hot hotly chasing you. And now, after all that experience and having created all these patents um, along the way, you say, I, I want to start a company. There's been a lot of uh, resilience that you've built. And every time you made the shift, you were nobody in the new system that you were going in. Like we have a portfolio founder who comes from a family of coconut, farm, uh, coconut farmers. For all his life, that's what he knew was the way of life. Until he found something unique, he pursued that, uh, became a Rubik's Cube champion, and that took him on a road to discover what's outside of coconut farming, took him, brought him to San Francisco. Today, he's he's building a VC-backed tech company, and it's one of the most brilliant out-of-box thinkers you'll find. So it's, the but but all the things that he went through gave him a lot of grit. So when there's adversity at this company, he will have the yeah. staying power to just fight through. Um, our, you know, one of the things we're blessed with at our fund is really high survival rates. Um, and, and one of the big functions of that is not just that we are great investors and we're investing in companies that we invest and they take off. There's a few of those, but more are where you really have to iterate a lot. And founders have consistently shown that they have the willingness to stay in the game. They will go through whatever it takes to stay in the game until it starts taking off. Um, so that's that's the third part of it, and and fourth, which for my uh, my framework is really really important, is the capability to understand and know what you don't know, and then the curiosity to go fill that gap. Mm. And you know, I, I I I would I wouldn't say that if you if you are a native citizen, you don't have that capability, but when you are an immigrant and you've had to force yourself to learn new things and, and get used to this new culture where the, the value systems are different. Like coming, growing up in India, honor system wasn't a thing. Everybody's got to protect your own thing. You come to the US, honor system is a thing. So you, you don't have to worry about petty stuff, but you have to learn to, to respect certain things about other people as well, because otherwise you'll offend them. And so this, this inane sort of process that you go through to adjust to a lot of things in builds that, that level of, what do I not know? What do I need to learn? Who can I learn it from? What's the, what's the quickest path to get to that? And so that makes you go after people who can, who can teach you that stuff that you haven't been through. And um, you know, as, as a founder, the, the, the worst thing you can do is try to learn everything on your own and, mm -hmm. and not leverage the learnings of people who've gone through it before yourself. And so I, th I think that sort of is a, is a hidden piece. And, and, and so bringing it all together, a combination of those four give you brilliant ideas plus, um, you know, a, a, a way to uh, a great confidence and curiosity to, to pull through the toughest times. And then when things start taking off, everybody kind of follows the parade, but the real magic is in that idea to before things start taking off time frame because um, that's the value of death as well for startups right a lot of startups don't get to the point where the flywheel is taking off yeah i i think of venture capital as a services business where i think of our lps that invest in the fund they're the shareholders and i think of the founders and the ceos as almost the customers and if you take that you know services view approach and it's highly competitive to be able to offer a service or even a differentiator, um, you know, is a positive thing. But I know you guys have evolved from fund one, fund two, and I think you're in getting into fund three right now. But what is, um, tell us the rest of the investment thesis. Like what stage, you, know, you guys are early. What, what, what stage should you invest at? What, what, what should entrepreneurs have already accomplished at the time that it's suitable to talk to you about a funding round? Yeah, we, we like to invest as early as we possibly can. So about two thirds of our investments happen pre-product, pre-revenue. Many of those companies we incorporate with the founders. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact that many times when we invest in founders, they are not full-time because they can't be there on a visa. They, they have an employer. Um, and so I would put it this way. We are more comfortable investing in founders and their upside than we are in investing in early versions of product. 
because early versions of the product create new questions that you're now trying to dig into knowing that you're trying to dig into that, but you're also discounting it because you know the product and the business and the segments are going to change so many times before this becomes a business. The constant will be the founders. And so we've, we've kind of focused all our energy to really, really understand the people. And if we understand the people, we are willing to, we're willing to invest before the first line of code, which has been the case with about two thirds of our company. So from a founder perspective, if if you think we can be the best partner for you, talk to us before anything. We love raw. We we have built the muscle to decipher the upside from your raw passion, your raw self awareness, your curiosity, coachability, and a lot of that comes through as we analyze and we talk to founders. There's some conversation about business, but it's more about like I like to get into oh, you decided to go after this problem in a, in a direct-to-consumer way. How did you make that decision? Because I'm really trying to understand the framework for how do, they, how do they slice things? How do they ask questions? Do they out, get, go out of the customer zo- uh, comfort zone and talk to customers? Uh, we put a lot of value on customer discovery. Before you've written any line of code, because you can do customer discovery while you're full-time working at, at some other place, and you know, get out of your comfort zone. Just don't build on intuition talk to customers, get into their skin and their life. Cause a lot of times you're building a product for someone who you have never been. And so just, you know, shadow them, see what they really do. Um, so founders who, who do that appeal to us a lot more. Doesn't mean every founder has to go live the life of a DevOps if you're going to build a DevOps product, but just the effort that you've made. Um, and, and, you know, part of like my partner, Man, and he loves to get into how have you come to the place you are today? What has been that journey like? And it's not to say that only the toughest journeys are the ones that we're investing in, but it's a really interesting angle because it brings about a lot of that character aspect of founders. Maria likes to dig into uh, how do you spend your time? <laughs> she, she, like For her, it's about if you spend your time on the highest priority things, chances are you're going to, you have a good prioritization model, and you will therefore be um, just with your time because that's the most limited uh, commodity. Capital can come from a lot of different places, but the founder's time is unit of one. And so we, we kind of approach it from a lot of these, these standpoints to ultimately get to, do we believe these founders can build a great company in whatever domain that might be? And then we look at, okay, the domain that you have picked as of today or the problem statement as of today how big could this become if you are able to execute? So market. Um, it, it's 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 kind of more like let's follow the founder's imagination for how they think. Like it could start as a point solution, but that point solution opens the door to with this we're going to get all this cluster of data which is going to be unique, and with that we can start building additional products on top for our existing set of customers. So. We, we, we try not to get overly bogged down if it's the right people. Because one of the fundamental beliefs is if we are backing the right people, they know that they want to solve big problems. The opportunity cost for them being involved in small problems is too high for them, right? right. Ours is a portfolio approach. If, if I have a portfolio of 40 companies, it's one out of 40. For them, it's a portfolio of one. If they're spending their time on a low value, small problem, they know they don't want to be there. They, they want to make a big difference in the world. So a lot of this is kind of really trying to understand how the founder looks at the, the future. How do they value their time? Are they trying to solve for a big change or, or they're comfortable with a small change and, and backing them for that upside and then just doing everything with them to help them get there faster. They will, they will be successful anyways, but if we can do anything to make that faster, we have served our purpose to your point of being a services business. Yeah, I, I, I say this in my first book that most tech companies will pivot at some point. So they start off as business to consumer and find out that B2B is much better for them or something. And in a world of pivots, what you're left with is the entrepreneur that you backed. So, you know, so it's, it is all about management team because in a world of pivots, everything changed except for the fact that it's still these people, you know, to back. So you're investing very early. I want to talk about valuations, check sizes. When when a founder is that early, if they're pre-product, 
okay, that is early. What what size check are you guys typically putting in? Like what's the smallest check you've ever written? And what's the biggest check you've ever written on a pre-product, obviously pre-revenue company? And, and what valuations are fair? And, and what valuations are you seeing? Um, and, and like, how big is the total round? Like you're probably, usually early stage is highly syndicated, right? It is and it isn't. There's so many flavors of this ice cream, to be honest, right? So it's it's kind of become um, it's kind of become a spectrum. Uh, the pre-seed and seed are more of a spectrum now, where you you are seeing less of round format. So there's institutional seeds where you know three million dollars being invested in one round. That's kind of what I call a structured round format. But you're also seeing around that. Um, small drips because different people are building conviction at different time. And so at the point that we're investing, um, we, we the best use of the capital is achieving two things. Iterate to figure out the, the answers to your biggest unknowns, right? So therefore that begs the question, do you know your biggest hypotheses or the biggest unknowns? And do you know the path to get the answers to those? So it takes a lot of iteration. Um, and the second piece is, what is the key technical breakthrough that we need to accomplish to make this solution work, right? And so um, in most cases where we are investing in um, anything that's technically founded, um, and that's not to say that we're not investing in sort of tech light products. There are some consumer products which are tech light and, and it's the business model or the experience that makes it different. But most of our investing is where there's some technical innovation. And um, so how do we get to the the most difficult or unanswered technical question so far. Um, for for instance, if it's a if it's an ML company, it could be that we can find this insight from this set of data, which has never been done before. So we can build a model to to make that happen, and so focus all your energy on getting the data and showing that you can build a model to get the insight, and and then we can start doing the productization of it with that takes more resources. So we're gonna to have to raise more capital, but with the technical proof and proof on which customers, which problem is solved by this innovation usually takes to the, to the seed round. In the process, um, you know, early versions of prototypes, MVPs get built. There are some users or customers that come on board as pilots because it's, it's it, the, the process continues even as companies are raising seed, they keep executing and so, a lot of times by the time a seed comes about, even in an enterprise product scenario, there is a pilot going on. Um, and so, so that, that progress continues. The, the, the check size that we, the way we look at the check size question is what amount of capitalization gives the company enough resources to get to the answers that are unknown today? Sometimes it's 250K, sometimes it's 750K. We are huge proponents of capital efficiency in the early days. So we, we work a lot with founders to really trim out the fat, which is, okay, you're trying to build this authentication thing on top of your product. Is it really important right now? Or is it more important that you, you can use some other, you know, Google Authenticator and, you know, just plug that in for now and let your users work with the, with the core of the product. Um, so a lot of the focus really goes into where do we spend resources now and, and the founders really appreciate that thought process. Um, but all, ultimately we get to a point where the, if we, if we put 300 K in this company, it gives them at least 15 to 18 months of, of iteration time. And when things start moving, we can help them raise more money. And, and so sometimes the answer is 300 K sometimes it's 700 K. If it's, if it's under 500K, we will generally either take all of the round or put in our 300, 400K check and help get the rest. If it's more than that, we then look at it as our 300K alone does not give them enough value. So let's create a syndicate that brings together the 750K. But I would say most of the times the pre-seed round is under 500K, 600K. Okay, so, so we so will commit our check without depending on anybody else. And, um, you know, one way of looking at it is like, what are the capital requirements here? Like, what's your monthly spend and how long will it be before you would hit zero bank balance? So 
how many employees are typically working at the startup at the time that you're investing? I would imagine sometimes it's like one to three people. It's just the founders when we start. Generally, it's just the founders, maybe a founding engineer alongside. Um, and then the team may grow a little bit as things start shifting. Um, so when they start getting more, more progress with customers, they may add a front end engineer because now we need to put the interface layer on. Um, but most of the hiring comes about after the seed is raised. So how many, how many founders do you typically see in a startup? Two, three. Two is the most common. So, so when you're funding 350K, what kind of runway does a company have with 350, 500K? Generally 15 to 18 months is what we're seeking before things start taking off. So if, if you need iteration time and you just stay this team of three people, you can go 15 months. And, and whenever the click happens, because in iteration, you don't know when you will hit that golden nugget, right? Sometimes that happens three months in. And as soon as that happens, it now means we need to hire more people to start building the product around it. That's the beginning of let's raise more capital so that we can, we can continue to hire more people, right? And, okay. and as more proof accumulates, conviction on the part of investors starts accumulating, right? Some of the people, when it was purely an idea, will not have enough conviction, but they see, oh, you were, you were able to prove that this model works and you have this pilot coming up with this customer. Now I have enough conviction. There will still be other investors who will say, I want to see the success of the pilot before I come in. And so they come in at that stage. And then I want to see a, a, a contract signed. So it, it's kind of that continuum. Right. And, and what we have kind of learned along the way is who likes to be at what point? And so how do we make this discovery happen? So, you know, Andrew likes to see things at X stage of the company and in Y kind of verticals. And so we should, we should send this to Andrew at this time, right? And that kind of, that is learning that we've had after sending you multiple things, hearing yeah, your I mean, feedback. You, you know us, you, you, you know when to send us stuff, which I always appreciate that you know, compared to someone sending me a pre-revenue biotech drug discovery deal, it's just like, that's not our sport, you know? Yeah, so it, it's that intelligence that that then helps capitalize the company in a drip format versus here's $20 million today and go do something with it, right? So the, the drip format kind of, kind of facilitates, um, you take 500K today at pre-seed terms, which are generally valuations of under 5 million, occasionally can i just ask you that question with a relatively short answer so um 500k going into a company that's got you know three fiercely dedicated founders and zero product and you think this is the right team to make the technology for this market what's the yep. are, 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 are is it convertible notes i mean it must be convertible notes Safe. or safes usually so do you prefer do you, you like safes do you prefer I, I prefer a safe versus like a kiss note. Um, no preference between those two. I just, I don't like convertible notes anymore because we've had a few distasteful incidents with our portfolio companies where some investors who had convertibles actually called. The, oh, so they want, the they want to their money back. Yeah. And it was like, dude, we're like, what are you even thinking? But um, convertible notes have that optionality. Now you can obviously put in clauses to, to take away that optionality. Safe, safe just makes it simple. And it's kind of become an industry standard where everybody's just start, just starting to do that. We are capable of doing very, very efficient preferred pre-seed as well, which works sometimes when, you know, for instance, founders license the technology from MIT and that has a warrant on it. And so the founders are interested in converting that warrant into equity sooner rather than later because it's a fixed equity amount water. So they leave it open till series A, MIT will get 6% at series A versus you do it at pre-seed, they're getting 6% at pre-seed. And so in those cases, we will, uh, we're very capable of doing a very quick pre-seed, uh, preferred pre-seed, which is not expensive at all. Uh, but most founders just like to move fast and, and that works for us as well. So it's a safe inside letter. Uh, yeah. agreement that has become pretty standard. And what what is the what's the range of valuations you're seeing right now? And do you see this changing or has it been constant through COVID? 
No, it's it's changed. Um, there there's a lot of heat. So I would say since about August September, as the market started getting really really hot, there's been um, a slight increase in valuation expectations. Not a lot. Not not like growth stages, but I would say for the most part, uh, we would say if it's purely idea stage company, just the founders, a valuation cap of between two and a half and four million, which in the heated environment has changed to three to five million. It's not, it's not a big so two change. To, so two to four million versus three to five. And does the ESOP come in later? So you're effectively investing at a higher valuation or do you have the employee stock option? It, it doesn't, in it, when investing on a safe, especially with the new post money safe um, documents, we, we typically have a 10% ESOP anyways, but uh, because the, the conversion formula excludes increase in um, options related to that round, right? So if you don't have options issued already, you will um, issue them in as part of the round, future round, conversion round. And therefore our, our, prefer, our preferences leave 10% in EIP when we are investing. Um, Sometimes founders don't do it just for efficiency sake, but in most cases when, you know, we have introduced them to a law firm, uh, for most law firms, setting up the EIP has become a 45 seconds thing. It's super templatized now. Um, I haven't faced any pushback from founders in setting up 10% aside in the EIP. So just we follow the standard 10% uh, availability norm. Okay. And, um, what was going to say? Um, oh yeah, do you guys um, sign side letter agreements that give you preferred shareholder rights that are not typically in the safe, like pro rata equity rights or information rights, things like that? Yeah, exactly that. Uh, it's the I, I think the side letter itself has gotten pretty standardized now. Uh, we looked at you know what what firms like First Round or Bloomberg have done, and we. we took learnings from that instead of recreating the wheel. Um, it's exactly those. It's it's pro rata investment rights, which you know, if we're if we're investing um, 300k on a three million post money safe, that's a 10% implied ownership. And so we'll say, give us a pro rata right to to invest up to 10% in future financings. Um, information rights. I I think most of these side letters have an have a MFN clause, which is you know, if you if you issue equity at a lower price in the future. Um, or issue safe at a, a lower cap in the future, match us on that. Haven't seen that happen since we invest so early. Yeah, and, and um, I've been burned. I've been burned on all these things. You know, like, uh, you know, I wasn't born asking for these things, but I find it pretty annoying if I invest at a valuation of say 10 million and then they raise on a 5 million afterwards. Um, you know, that sucks. The other thing that's really horrible is uh, you you invest in a bunch of companies hoping to double down on your best performing winners, and you find that your convertible note converts into equity, say at the series A, when benchmark is investing. And now that benchmark is investing and all that money that's coming in, I want to double down and put more of my fund in that. And then benchmark is playing rough and says, we have an ownership target percentage of 20% and we're barely getting that. Um, congratulations, your pro rata equity right will apply to the series B. And um, because <laughs> You're just a bondholder, and now, congratulations, you're a shareholder of this round. We're taking the whole thing, and feel free to invest in the B, which would not give you the 100x return. You know, it'll give you a 4x return because it's so damn frothy. Everybody wants to be in the benchmark, you know, Bain Capital's yeah. cold calls. Yeah. Um, our view ha has also been informed with uh, the way our portfolio companies have gone through very competitive series A's. So the way the way we look at internally, and we, we tell our LPs this as well, that the pro rata right, you can sign all the agreements you want, but it's a right that while it's legal, it has to be earned. And it has to be earned by working for the founders. So yeah. what we have practically seen happen is, for example, a portfolio company raised a series A with Kanan. Kanan said, we don't, like you, you can increase the size of the round. We want our 20%, the round will be a 25%. Uh, the other 5% you can allocate the way you like. They, they told the CEO, you allocated the way you like. Um, and so 
in doing that, the, now it's on to the CEO. She cannot honor everybody's pro rata rights because they are larger than the 5%. And so she chose based on who's been most helpful, who's been most on her, yeah. um, on her side, who's contributed the most and therefore has earned the right to invest in that round. And, you yeah. know, as we look across the board, the founders kind of look at it as you took you know, you had the trust in us to do when nobody else was doing, uh, when nobody else could believe in us. And you've worked with us right by our side through the toughest times. Now that the company is becoming a hot company, we want to give you the most allocation we can. So in, in, in many cases, we've had to waive our pro rata right, which was in, in coincidentally in situations where we had the smallest pro rata right. So you know, they were the smaller end of the checks. But in most other cases, the founders have really fought for our rights and we've gotten more than our pro rata allocation because of the yeah. way we work with the founders. And yeah. so I think we, we kind of intentionally follow that. Okay, we'll do the side letter, which actually gives the founder a way to fight that incoming investor um, and, and say, I need to give Unshackled this right because I signed this document. But it's, it's truly, that only works when the founder wants to fight for you. And yeah. so it's an ammunition in, for, the, for the founder, but we, we really take the approach of, we have to do the hard work to earn that. And we tell the founders that if you don't think we've earned it, give us the waiver and we'll sign the waiver. Yeah, I, I call this the emotional pro rata, that, that there is a legal pro rata <laughs> and there's the emotional pro rata, which is subjective and, 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 and the word earn is the right thing to say. You have to earn that. And uh, some entrepreneurs, um, are like Mark Zuckerberg on one end of the spectrum that they're not gonna get uh, tossed around by a big investor and just bow to the biggest, newest investor, but they actually take care of the people that got them where they are and they you know, fight hard to protect it. I encourage entrepreneurs to be more of a Zuckerberg and stand up to the VC who is distracted by 80 portfolio companies while you're focused on the one and to, do the right thing by your early early investors. Um, I, I I don't like the behavior of the newest investor not allowing existing investors to, you know, to invest. I think, you know, as a rule of thumb, like a third of the round, new investor can set terms take half, and um, a third of the round being taken up by existing investors is a good signal that people who know we've got post investor DD you know, are, 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 you know, continue to have conviction and they know where all the bodies are and then uh, bring in some new blood to get more network around that company to, to yeah. help it. You know, I, 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 I got a call, I got to jump on, but I'll close with saying one thing. I think a lot of VCs in Silicon Valley are five white men from Boston who pretend to be uh, from California. And that's not a lot of diversity to support your company. But hey, Nitin, I've got, I got my next call, but uh, let's get together soon. Maybe do a walking meeting. And thanks again and catch us in. That sounds like fun. Uh, hi, Anna. Uh, hi, sorry, sorry. Uh, this, this seems to be a Andrew's, busy line. <laughs> Andrew's, uh, Andrew's doing something he didn't intend it. He's connecting people. Um, but this was great, Andrew. Yeah, let's do the, let's do the walk -in, uh, walking meeting and take it from there. Okay, thanks, bud. See you later. All right. Bye for now. All right.